Because yeah, I couldn't find my slides this morning, so I'm going to talk about the Westminster launch. <laughs> <laughs> That's the new ball. That's the new ball. That's Cujo's ball. Okay. So I'm John O'Keefe. Uh, I work for Instantiation. And I'm here today to tell you about uh, the latest information about uh, the VA Smalltalk product. Um, I've been coming to NISA for, I'm not quite sure how many years. My first NISA was Uganda, so that's a number of years ago. And uh, I always do this presentation. So today, um, we're going to talk about a little bit about the company that I work for. Um, a little bit about what our current upcoming release is going to contain, a little bit about what's going on past that, and then you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. If uh, you want to ask a question during the presentation, uh, please feel free. Okay, um, Instantiations as a company, we are uh, still doing intensive new technology development. We have an upcoming product release that I'm going to talk about today, and uh, we continue to work on our 32-64-bit VM, which I'm going to talk about at the end of the presentation. Um, we engage in community outreach and that we sponsor and participate in ISOG and in FAST's uh, Small Talks Conference. And we sponsor Camp Small Talks in North America. Uh, we're sponsoring the Marquette, Michigan Camp Small Talk in uh, about two and a half weeks. And we're going to be hosting a Camp Small Talk in North Carolina in uh, spring, either probably late March or early April of uh, 2017. So what are, what are we focused on as, as a company in our development activities <coughs> Uh, we're focused on uh, things that are near term and that they're going to go into the next release we deliver. We're focused on things that are internal to the company, infrastructure, and we're focused on things for over, that are developed over a longer span than one release and will be uh, available as they uh, are finished. So near term for the next release, we have enhanced the cryptography support. We've added TCP IP IPv6. Um, we've enhanced our installation. Um, in terms of our infrastructure, which you might think you don't care about, but you really do. Um, we've re-engineered our build system. And for follow-on releases, I'm going to be talking about our VM. So our next release will be available fourth quarter this year, 863. Um, and um, what it's going to have is changes to the base class library. We've had uh, zip support, zip file support, and inflate deflate um, for uh, a couple releases. We've added some convenience mess messages, APIs for inflate deflate just to make it easier to use. And kind of looking forward to 64-bit uh, VM, but still useful in 32-bit, uh, we've added an OS long class to represent 64-bit uh, data, or sometimes 64-bit data, uh, in, uh, in the image. So this simplifies the handling of what will be 64-bit data. Uh, it transparently um, resizes uh, between 32 and 64 bit systems, and it transparently adapts to the platform that you're running on, because a long on Windows is different than a long on Unix. So uh, you take that into account. In terms of IPv6, um, 
we've had uh, TCP support in the product, both at the basic socket interface and at the uh, server small talk level of the product, which has the HTTP support in it um, for some time, uh, since version 4. But uh, now we've uh, enabled all layers of the product for IPv6 for the next release. So that's the socket communication layer, the server small talk layer with HTTP, and the parts layer, which is the layer that supports visual construction of applications. Uh, we've enhanced the UI to handle the notion of IPv4 syntax versus IPv6 syntax, which is much more complicated. And um, we've added preferences to the INI file, the startup customization file, um, to control the addressing behavior. Because we know that some people will want IPv6 by default, some people will want to continue with IPv4 by default. So by default, we get IPv4. And so the behavior then is exactly the same in this release as it was in the previous release. When, the, when IPv4 is the default. Um, Seaside and Greece, we actually, uh, in our previous release, 8.6.2, um, ship code that was very, very close to what um, is the frozen 3.2.0 level of Seaside. So we only had to make a few small uh, currency updates and adapt the code to support IPv6. Um, in terms of cryptography, um, we're now OpenSSL 1.1 compatible. We have lots of new algorithms. 1.1 is still in beta. Uh, we've been tracking the betas and adapting to uh, the 1.1 betas as they come out. We're hoping that 1.1 gets frozen before we ship. Um, but if not, uh, we will uh, ship with support for the most recent data code. We continue to uh, support and enhance 10x version of OpenSSL, but um, you'll notice if you look at OpenSSL that the APIs have changed considerably between 10x and 11. Uh, big overhaul. They, they've uh, made a lot of the structures that were formerly exposed, now opaque, and they, they made a lot of API breaking moves as they've gone to 1.1. So that would be a difficulty for our customers if they wanted to move up, except for the good work that, uh, that Seth did, and he's hidden all of those changes um, so that uh, we handle them internally and there's no code changes required for customers to move from 10x to 1.1. The other new thing that we have in cryptography is the secure memory support. So if you have uh, information that your program uses, like passwords or other sensitive information that's stored in memory, and something happens to cause a dump, uh, it'd be kind of nice if that uh, secure information didn't show up in the dump. So that's one <laughs> example of where secure memory support is important. And we support this both on Windows and Unix. The support is a little bit different because the underlying operating system capabilities are a little bit different between the two systems. On uh, Windows, users can request that uh, bytes of data are encrypted in memory and then they're auto decrypted when you use when you use them through the open SSL native, native interfaces. And this support relies on the Microsoft Crypto API. So that's Windows. Unix has <coughs> Unix has a little better uh, support, a little different support that uh, Unix itself supports something called secure arenas. 
uh, which is page guarded at both ends so that you can't, uh, a buffer overflow can't write into the uh, secure arena. Um, and it's pinned to RAM, so this is different from Windows in that on Unix it won't swap to disk, so it never appears in, in your uh, swap file. And it won't show up in court. Um, on Windows, uh, it will show up in court, but it's encrypted. For SQLite, um, we actually haven't uh, done anything in Smalltalk itself, but we've updated the underlying uh, SQLite DLL to 3.14.0, which does provide uh, transparent performance improvements for SQLite uh, of, uh, in the range of 5% improvements in performance. So we got something for free there. We always like that. Now, um, we have a launcher for our development environment. It's called <coughs> Environments, because it launches environments, development environments. And uh, this has been around for a couple releases. Uh, and we try and make some improvements in each release. Uh, in this release, um, we uh, added some capability to satisfy customer requests. Uh, Customers wanted to be able to open a, uh, an file explorer uh, on the directory where VA Smalltalk is installed for the current environment, because you may have multiple VA Smalltalk installations on the system. Open a command terminal window on uh, the selected environments folder. So you can manipulate something there, or open a command terminal window on the folder where the small is installed for the current environment. Or uh, kind of most interesting is duplicate the selected environment, because this gives you a capability to do a couple things. It lets you set up and use standardized images, and then duplicate them. And the other thing it lets you do is it lets you clone your development environment so that you can essentially take checkpoints of, of your work. And it's a lot easier to step back than if something goes wrong. So those are just two examples of where duplicating an environment might be interesting. Um, I mentioned our installers earlier. Um, all of our Installers in this release are he not headless. They, uh, they would not run headless in the previous release. Uh, we use RPM for Fedora, Red Hat based systems, Debian installer for uh, Debian derivatives, and the PKG installer for Solaris. And in addition to that, the Windows installer can now be scripted. So that if you want standardized window installs, you can, you can write a script to drive it. You don't have to drive it to the root anymore. Uh, Windows doesn't really have the notion of a headless system. So I don't talk about it as a headless installer. Yes, sir? Uh, are these installers the way you ship? Or are these installers the way your customers use to, to deploy their application? This is the way we ship. So we ship the product in four different formats. Um, for 863, we have new operating system support. We always try and move up to the latest version of operating systems that uh, are available at the time we ship. And moving up means that we have to do regression tests on uh, those operating systems, both for our development environment and for our runtime environment. So as of this release, we now support Ubuntu 16.04, Fedora 24, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6. Uh, for Red Hat, it's a, it's a pretty big jump. We haven't, we haven't uh, done regression testing on Red Hat for some time. Um, 
Okay, I talked about re-engineering our build system. So uh, I first want to kind of talk about each of the words in the um, first bullet. When I say old, I mean the one that we used for 862 and earlier. Um, when I say image build, I mean the tools that collect together changes in the repository, build the images, which there are two, uh, a base image and an advanced image, uh, build the MRI files, um, and put that in a, a place where the next step can process it. Okay? When I say installation build, it means taking that information and packaging up in one of those four formats. Okay? Now, the way it used to be done is both the image build and the installation build were all custom small talk code that was written in the early 90s and really hasn't whole, had a whole lot of change since then um, for several reasons, uh, one of which is this kind of effort that doesn't show through to our customers at the end of the day. Um, I guess that I would say that this code was not the best code quality. Um, that's maybe being uh, sympathetic to it. Um, but it worked. That's the important thing. But the fact that the code quality wasn't great meant that it was very difficult for us to make modifications. So we didn't. Um, the builds were slow with a lot of manual intervention. Um, the Windows and Unix builds were sequential. You had to do Windows first and then Unix. It was difficult to restart the build if problems occurred because it really wasn't a restart capability. And the installation artifacts the things that came out of this build were unmanaged. I'm sorry, the things that go into the build were unmanaged. The thing that comes out is the install uh, package. So, new means 863. <coughs> the other words mean the same as they did before. We now have a CMake based system, so we can script our build. Um, you can restart the build in any of the job steps, and there's a lot of them. Um, and we've removed duplicate and redundant code uh, from the build process. We still use Smalltalk as part of the build because there are things like actually building an image that requires Smalltalk to do. Uh, but we now can drive it with something called AB, abt.cnf, a startup configuration file where you can script your small talk image. Um, we're, going, we're going to be doing fully automated nightly builds if changes occur. If no changes occur, no nightly build. Um, and we're going to maintain the installable artifacts, the things that come out of the image build, in Git repositories. So that's both the things that we create um, from the image build and things like uh, documentation files that are created uh, outside the image build. So, now moving from the build process to the install process. Our old installation, again, was Smalltalk uh, package images. Uh, these were difficult to maintain for the same reason the build code was difficult to maintain. Um, the installs were slow because they installed by copies, files, file by file, and the file attributes being in, in separate shadow files then had to be applied to the file once they were installed. Now we're using the standard system installers, which run much faster uh, because of several reasons. Uh, they're built to, they're really designed to install fast. Um, 
we moved the documentation to a separate package. We actually did this in the previous release. So that the client install is much smaller. And in general, the download packages are smaller uh, as you get them from our website. So, um, so why would you care about this? You know, this is nice for us. Uh, you care about it because it drives into our testing. And our testing, if we do it well, means you get better code out the end. Uh, previously, old means previous release, uh, we only did VM test build testing in an automated manner. Every time we built the VM, we ran a, a series of test cases. Uh, new means this release. Uh, we have automated the build testing with, again, CMake and CTest, so that we do install verification tests. We install both, we install all four um, packages on the systems that they support, uh, and make sure that the right files get put in the right place. We do the VM tests, which has been uh, improved, and we do image tests. And one important thing here is that all platforms can be tested in parallel. No longer is this a sequential process. We currently have over 10,000 mainline test cases and many more test cases. The mainline test cases are run automatically. The other test cases are run uh, manually for the features. But they're, they're either S-unit test cases or GUI test cases. So that's what's in 863. Um, as far as our future releases, our releases come out about once a year. Um, you can find what's in the current release and what we're thinking about for the next release on our website. Um, we get our input based on surveys. We did a large survey earlier this year. Um, direct customer interactions through phone calls and email. Uh, our forums um, on Google, uh, support cases, sometimes we get support cases that turn out to be feature requests, and things, internal things that we need, like the uh, effort to revamp our you know, build system infrastructure. So next release candidate items, we will continue to track changes in Seaside and uh, react to them uh, as needed. In terms of middleware, uh, we're looking at uh, Postgres and uh, Seth reminded me that I spelled my SQL wrong. Well, in case. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but we're looking at uh, Voyage or MongoDB or something that would be a database that does not involve SQL. Um, we continue to look at uh, GUI look and feel. One thing we want to do, we don't actually have a common Windows application framework. So it's, it's more difficult than it needs to be in the base system to build Windows. In the uh, visual system, it's done quite nicely, either through the composition editor or the window builder add-on product. And we continue to evaluate whether we're going to uh, implement GTK support Linux to improve our open field there. In terms of communication, we're looking at HTTP2 and 0MQ, which is a very low, uh, well, a very high performance communication mechanism um, that is really an alternative to using standard TCP between machines. And we want to look at uh, building easy to use server farms. Uh, and we have some ideas about how to do that. We've actually had server farm support since version three um, in different forms. And, um, but it's not so easy to use and we need to make it easier to use. It's, in fact, most people don't even know we have it. In terms of development support, 
Uh, we want to improve code library access over the LAN. We run really well over LANs, but we have issues over wide area networks. Because our interface to the repository is very chatty, we have developed internally tools that allow us to uh, overcome that problem, and we're evaluating whether we should use those tools or whether we should do something different. But, uh, it's obvious that we have mechanisms for greatly improving performance when running over a uh, And we're looking at uh, ways we can revamp our changes browser and provide a new, uh, a new change merge engine uh, because ours is, uh, is rather dated. In terms of performance and scalability, um, we're going to uh, work on the garbage collector we have an incremental garbage collector, and we're going to provide 64-bit small talks. Now, I stood up here last year and the year before, and maybe the year before that, <laughs> I'm not sure, and talked about how we were going to have 64-bit small talk. Well, now we're actually going to have it. So next year, when I make this presentation, I won't have to say, we're going to have it. And so I wanted to talk just a little bit about how we're going to have it, how we're getting to have it. So um, our goal is 64-bit DMs for x86, PowerPC, and Solaris, 32-bit DMs with performance at least as good as production. When I say production, that means the current 64-bit VMs, better performance. And uh, we want to improve our build system and testing infrastructure, just as we did for image build and for installation build. Uh, we're doing it for <coughs> VM build. So just to review what we have now, uh, the production VM is a proprietary small talk model uh, of the VM, which generates assembler code. It actually generates something called portable assembler code, which then generates the specific machine assembler code based on what platform you generate. Uh, the VM interpreter, the JIT, and um, the primitives are in the generated assembler code. And supporting modules are written in C. So, the current VM has 135,000 lines of assembler and 50,000 lines of C. Just to give you kind of an idea of the complexity of, uh, of this code base. That's, uh, that's not handwritten assembly, that's the generated assembly. So where are we going from here? Well, first thing is we needed an improved uh, build infrastructure. So we're running CMake-based build system, just like we were for image and install build. It uses GCC, MinGW, and MSVC. Um, we have 32 and 64-bit virtual machines currently running on Windows and Linux. Yes, they exist. Yes, they run. Um, and we're currently working on interpreter performance. So we're following the, uh, the old software development adage Make it. Build it, make it, make it work, and make it fast. Okay, so our current focus is on make it fast, working on uh, interpreter performance. Um, and then in terms of the image, you have 32 and 64 bit images. The 64 bit images are actually uh, created on the fly the first time from the 32 bit image. So when you load a 32 bit image, with a 64-bit VM, it transforms, automatically transforms that image, all the objects in the image in the 64-bit format. So we don't need a separate uh, image uh, transformation of the utility. Uh, of course, small talk image and many of the libraries, the libraries being add-on features like database and OLA, things like that, um, are all 64-bit prepped. So they all work in the 64-bit VM, and we're continuing to focus on getting the rest of the libraries, the 
the ones that uh, get less usage correct. So how did we go from the current VM to the new one? Well, it, it was a journey. Uh, the first generation uh, new VM called Raptor uh, was a C interpreter in place of the generated assembly code. It was slow, but it ran on 64 bits, so it was clean. We got about 80% of the bytecode speed of the current VM, and unfortunately only 50% of the speed for uh, message settings. And part of that relates to the fact that C doesn't give us the freedom that our generated assembler code did in management of registers. So a small talk process switching was slow, uh, but the primitives, which have now all been rewritten in C, uh, were much faster. Often, in some cases, many times faster. The importance of Raptor is it allowed us to move forward uh, with our image work um, while we considered what we could do to improve the VM uh, issues that we were identified here. So this was about 90,000 lines of C code. Some of it came from uh, production VM, some of it was reviews, but most of it was new. So we moved from Raptor to Indominus Rex. Uh, perhaps you can see a pattern in the naming of these. <laughs> Um, this is our second generation C interpreter. Uh, we really worked on tuning the C implementation and we got, we got uh, from 80 to 85 percent on bytecode speed and 50 to 75 percent on message send speed. And once again, the primitive implementation uh, very often is faster than the production. And this is our stable reference base for our VMs. So, when we have a problem, we can go back to this VM to debug because it's easier to debug on a C VM than the one I'm going to show you next. But the problem with this VM in terms of trying to achieve performance is that small changes to the large interpreter loop uh, resulted in extremely unpredictable behavior as GCC tried to optimize but often de-optimized our code. And so we were constantly fighting with the compiler, trying to get it to leave our registers alone and let us do what we wanted to do. Um, so we went from 90,000 lines to 85,000 lines of code. Less code, must run faster. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it became obvious that this was not going to we're not going to be able to reach our goal here because of this constant fight with the compiler. So we moved on to Coelho, or Coelho Physis, as its uh, official name, I guess, is, which is based on LLVM code generation. So LLVM is a compiler toolkit, and it uses a uh, single storage address abstract assembly representation. But um, we're still down one register on x86. A real issue is with x86 because of the very, very limited number of registers. Um, you can't, we still can't use the hardware stack register because the system uses it. But superior code generation compared to, to uh, any of the C compilers, including GCC and all its uh, optimizations uh, make up for the fact that we don't have uh, this register available. So now we, we currently, and as I say, we're still working on this, we currently are at 100% bytecode speed on 32-bit and 110% message set speed. So we're equal <coughs> And as I mentioned earlier, for many of the prims, floats in particular, um, the production VM used callouts to C from its generated assembly code, and this caused performance issues because of the stack setup. And, uh, yeah. So these are now described directly in LLVM 
And we've got speed ups on these particular primitives more like four to six times uh, the previous performance. So now we're at 19,000 lines of C++ code for the generated for the interpreter and 75,000 lines of C code. And this is, this is the version of VM that we will be shipping them in the product. And once we're satisfied with its performance and its reliability. We currently have an early customer access program in place. Uh, we started in July with a small number of customers to get early feedback on viability of our VM, to let them play with it, tell us if there's something in it that, that causes them issues. So we want the feedback and we want collaboration from them uh, as they attempt to use our 64-bit system to access their 64-bit uh, DLLs, for example, something we can't do today. So, interested in any of that? Interested in all of that? Uh, how would you get um, the A small talk? Um, I don't have boxes of it up here on the podium. But you can download it. You can download an evaluation copy. Even better than that, you can buy developer licenses. <laughs> we like that. Um, we occasionally have development builds available. These, for example, are what are going into the uh, customer uh, access program. This is our uh, weekly uh, build. Um, are you working on an open source project? Is it in small talk? Good. Just uh, just ask us, and we'll send you a uh, we'll send you a paid up license so that you can hopefully port it to be a small talk. Uh, are you an educator? Are you a professor? Are you a student? Send us send us email. We'll send you a license. So it's real easy. It's real easy to get the product. As I say, we like to buy it, but if you, you know, if you can't afford it, you know, students, students out there, um, we'll give you a copy. So uh, this is this is our contact information. Um, if all else fails, you can write to me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, do you have questions? Um, Dave. You seem to have all the platforms except the one I'm interested in. Which is? Mac. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what's, is there a path to that? or? Is there a path to that? Um, we currently do not build VMs for Mac. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to talk over you here. Uh, the issue is not so much building the VMs as adapting our GUI system to uh, max GUI support because it's, it's much different, of course, than either Windows or anything that runs on Linux. And so we feel like if we were going to do a Mac version, it would need to run just like on all of our other platforms, native GUI. <coughs> so that's the hang. Other questions? So that Neil. Didn't describe that. So you have no, no plans? We, we currently have no plans. Okay. Um, you can always run a uh, Windows emulator, VMware. <laughs> Neil. Uh, would I be right in thinking that your uh, database tests are feature tests that you're not running in parallel? Or would I be wrong when you have actually managed to run all your database tests uh, in parallel for the different platforms? We certainly would like to run them in parallel for different platforms, but we don't currently. Okay. Yeah, I, I, know, I know why that's sometimes a little difficult. Um, and uh, yeah, let's talk about that out offline. So the question was, is, uh, are our database tests automated? And the answer is no. Uh, Norm. Did you switch to LLVM for all your platforms or just some? 
So um, we currently are building on Windows and Linux using LLVM. Uh, we will be building for uh, AIX and Solaris. Uh, we have experimented on those platforms, but we're not doing very good things. We're really focused on uh, two platforms that have different, sort of different underlying behavior to make sure that um, we can handle that and then we move along. So it is, it is possible, it is possible that when the 64-bit VM gets released, it will be Indominus Rex on AIX and Solaris and Quill uh, on uh, Windows and Linux. And that's, that's why it's important that we keep the two in, in sync. Not most important to help us in debugging because debugging the LLVM is not a pretty picture. Um, but also so that we have the flexibility uh, of having a reference platform written in C which will compile essentially the UR. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. I'll be here the rest of the week.